Welcome to the Dispatch Podcast. I'm Sarah Isger with Mike Warren, Jonah Goldberg, and Steve Hayes in a sort of roundabout kind of way. And you know what, guys? We're just going to do some potpourri news of the day, see where the spirit moves us. And Mike, I'm coming to you first because we have primaries this Tuesday. I mean, in a technical sense, people were allowed to vote. Did you learn anything from those primaries? Uh, yes, which I guess is this. I should say I learned what I already knew. So maybe I didn't learn anything, Sarah. Uh, I learned that uh, Republicans really like Donald Trump and will uh, follow uh, his lead when there's a question about where Republicans should go. And I'm talking mostly about the Ohio Senate primary in which uh, polls suggested going into the race on Tuesday um, that there was a race, that there was a there was some competition between Bernie Moreno, who was a uh, businessman, ran for Senate two years ago, didn't win the primary, didn't survive th- through the primary, uh, and uh, Matt Dolan, who's a, a uh, moderate conservative state senator, um, who is kind of not a Trump type leading Republican. Um, so it got kind of interesting that uh, Mike DeWine, the Republican governor, had endorsed Dolan. Donald Trump had endorsed uh, Bernie Marino, and it was sort of setting things up for like, ooh, this may tell us some interesting things about about the Republican Party in very red, very otherwise pro-Trump Ohio. Um, and then, of course, Bernie Moreno like like wipes the floor with Dolan and, and Frank LaRose, the other candidate, gets over 50% of the vote in a three-way primary. And um, – and yeah, and and confirms what I should have already known, which is that it's Trump's party, and uh, and when uh, voters, uh, you know, will take their lead from him, uh, Trump says jump, and the voters say how high, Mr. President. Can I tell you what was interesting to me about that in particular was that in a bunch of the other states where we still had presidential primaries going on, there was a, I don't know, a healthy whatever you want to call it. Um, not Trump vote, you know, around 20% in a lot of these states, whether they were still voting for Haley or in Florida, there was a little bit of a DeSantis vote, um, et cetera. But the way that I think about this moving forward and why I don't read nearly as much into it, I think, as others is because um, you're not controlling for the denominator, right? Fewer people show up when the primary doesn't matter. So who's more likely to show up when the primary doesn't matter? Well, the very people who want to have their voice of protest heard. So the the Trump people should be feeling quite complacent. Their guy is the nominee, no question about it. And that's what makes Ohio interesting to me, is that we didn't see that complacency in Ohio at all. In fact, it's the inverse of what I'm talking about. Um, you know, why was there not a bigger, you know, quote unquote, protest vote if Trump is so clearly the nominee, et cetera. So um, that was interesting to me. And I'm curious what you think of my concept that people are overreading the quote unquote protest vote against Donald Trump because actually turnout's just so low in a primary that doesn't matter that the protesters turn out more than the Trump voters. And so when you say uh, half of those people say they're going to vote for Joe Biden or they're not going to vote for Donald Trump, it's like, okay, well, first of all, I don't believe all of them will actually do that in the end. But even so, we're really talking fewer and fewer people and self-selecting people who show up to a primary that won't affect the outcome. Right. You're you're a Republican primary voter in uh, Florida or Ohio, and you're really ticked off about Donald Trump taking over the party. You're going to be sure to get to the polls even and maybe even especially because it doesn't matter. Um, I agree with that assessment. You know, Ohio had this competitive Senate primary, lots of competitive House primaries on the Republican side. Um, There's also a lot of early vote in Ohio. So um, there are a lot of uh, people who voted for Nikki Haley, you know, in in the presidential primary before she had suspended her campaign uh, because of the early vote. So um, I I do think there's, you, you shouldn't read too much into that protest vote. It's it's there. It exists. I do think there is, um, if Donald Trump has a problem, his biggest problem from a raw vote standpoint going into November is that there are people who lean Republican 
who, if it were pretty much any other Republican candidate, would be voting for the Republican presidential uh, uh, ticket in November, who will not. The question is, how many of them, which states, uh, it, will it be the key states of Georgia and Michigan and Pennsylvania and Wisconsin and Arizona? Um, whether that matters, it's all about the margins, baby. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just yeah, go ahead. Mm-hmm. Yes. Jonah, ahead. my dear Jonah. <laughs> yes. yes, Sarah. <laughs> Uh, okay. Is this going to be a race of the exhausted majority? Is that how we're going to remember this the way that we remembered soccer moms in the 90s and security moms after 9-11? That this will be a race among the people who hate both candidates, the lean Republicans who won't vote for Donald Trump and the Democrats who reject Joe Biden? Or is that us being too dispatchy and thinking people all think like us? Okay. So... Just, I want to push back a little bit on you guys in your 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 reverie of self congratulation about how you actually understand all, all this stuff. Um, <laughs> I'm not saying you're wrong, right? But when when Mike, when you say uh, we shouldn't overread it or we shouldn't read too much into it, I think you're right. At the same time, we should read something into it, and um, you can you can look at the fact that particularly in closed primaries, Republicans. So these are actual Republicans. These are people who didn't switch their party ID to vote in the Republican primary, right? These aren't people who voted as independents or registered same day or anything like that. Like a big chunk of them are actual real Republicans. I agree that the most motivated people who don't like Donald Trump, just as the most motivated people who do like Donald Trump are going to be overrepresented in a meaningless primary at this point. At the same time, the fact that even some Republicans are willing to come out and vote against the guy when they know they're going to lose anyway might be also indicative that there are other people who feel the same way who didn't bother, right? I mean, so it can cut both ways. I don't think it's like this proves automatically that there's a tiny number of these people. Um, I think it proves that there's a weird diversity of these people. And... um, and you're, but you're absolutely right. It matters at the margins. On the question of, I don't think we at the dispatch are projecting upon the double haters dispatchian mindsets. Um, because I think, at least for, in my case, there are many people out there who I think for whom are editorial about how this is no way to run a railroad and that this election stinks. Um, who very much are the high-minded, discerning, quality people that we have in mind when we write our editorials and when we do everything as servants of our readers and subscribers here at The Dispatch. But a lot of double haters are low-propensity voters who are not following the election at all, who, um, you know, it's funny, I've had, this, I've had these kinds of conversations with a bunch of people who are shocked to find out that they know people who don't care about politics and um don't follow politics and i was they're like you wouldn't believe it i was talking to somebody and they're asking me like who is robert f kennedy like how do they not know that and i was like that's because like they're a normal human being and um there are a lot of those people who are actually qualify as the double haters there are a lot of those people who are like you know the biden team was telling people in um Earlier in the primaries, earlier this year, um, I talked to several journalists who went to these briefings about it, that, that, hey, look, when we do focus groups, a lot of the people who say they don't like Joe Biden, um, they also say, wait a second, you're not serious. The Republicans aren't going to actually renominate Donald Trump again. And um, if you'd been paying any attention at all, you'd know that, yeah, they were going to pay, not like last month, you would have known that they were going to renominate Donald Trump again. They're just not paying attention. They're not tuned in. We've seen the traffic of a lot of right wing sites plummet. S- traffic in, in sort of news interest in general is, is plummeted. And um, those aren't dispatch readers. Those are like more normal Americans. No offense to the lofty and angelic dispatch subscribers. Um, uh, and I do think they are the soccer moms of this cycle and they are going to be the decisive people. Um, and I kind of prefer that they are versus a lot of other bogus artificial demographic 
handles that we've used in the past. So I don't I don't think we're that far off, Jonah. By the way, I I I, I really no, I agree. do kind of agree with you on 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 the broad strokes uh, of, of of what you said. By the way, it, re- it puts me in mind, Sarah, of one of my favorite quotes of all time um, that I'll paraphrase, which was from Ed Rendell, I believe, during the two thousand eight um, Democratic primary, uh, which. Uh, in which he said um, that you know you don't get an extra vote for enthusiasm if you are unenthusiastic Biden voter, you're still a Biden voter. So that's important to keep in mind. Yeah, as well. so funny. I was actually using that quote with someone else this week because you know the different numbers that you can parse the Trump protest vote in the primaries was larger than the Biden protest vote in these primaries. Trump's was about 20 percent. Biden's was about 10 percent. But then in the polls, when you ask uh, Republican primary voters how enthusiastic they are about Donald Trump, that number is much higher than Joe Biden's number in the Democratic Party. And I was like, yeah, that number doesn't matter as much as you think. What you're trying to get at is sort of who's going to stay home. But at the end of the day, the Biden campaign doesn't care if you're sad about voting for him, if you're voting for him. (laughs) Your your happiness is not their primary concern, or else we wouldn't have, you know, negative campaigning for the last ever, all of it. <laughs> uh, negative campaigns work even though voters hate them because they still vote the way that you want them to based on the negative campaigning. Um, Mike, I thought we could do a little update on some of the Trump trials, the well, just all of it going on because there's been some weird little updates and I just think it's worth a quick nosh, if you will. All right, so first up, the update coming out of the Georgia January 6th case, Fonnie Willis not removed as the prosecutor, but the judge writing a scathing opinion about her tremendously poor judgment, uh, though noting that um, a prosecutor who does bad things, even repeatedly, as he said, does not necessarily warrant removal, even noting at one point she had acted unlawfully, but that that had not risen to the level of removal. Mike, it was sort of the worst win you can have as a prosecutor. Yeah, it reminded me of when James Comey announced that uh, they were not going to be prosecuting Hillary Clinton, um, which like just made things even worse for Hillary. Um, yeah, th- that was, that was really bad. Uh, <laughs> that was a bad assessment of Fonnie Willis's behavior. And in, in my estimation, it was correct. She behaved really, really badly, um, by making some really stupid decisions, hiring her, her, her boy toy as a special prosecutor, whether or not they were romantically involved beforehand, uh, before she hired him or after she hired him, it was just a bad look. And I will say that the judge's assessment also extended to her testimony in the hearing. Uh, and and we cover that in the collision. And I watched that hearing live uh, and Fonnie Willis is uh, really performing, uh, trying to really, it, I, I, in fact, I spoke with some people in Georgia afterward in which they said she's not performing for the benefit of the judge. She's performing for the benefit of her constituency. Um, she's an elected official in Fulton County. It's a very Democratic county. Um, and uh, <laughs> it was a good thing she wasn't performing for the judge because he was unimpressed with uh, her sort of flippant performance uh, there. What's fascinating to me is, I, and people have largely glossed over this, he found that she acted improperly when she gave her speech at that AME church where she said that her critics were using the race card because he found that it was clear in the context that she included the defendants in that and that therefore she was potentially tainting the jury pool by calling the defendants racist and that that was improper for a prosecutor. Now, he said it was not so prejudicial as to rise to the level of removing the prosecutor, which is an extraordinary remedy. But he said it will be up to the state bar of Georgia, the state legislature, and the voters of Fulton County, what they may want to do about that. Um, you know, a finding from a state judge that you acted improperly for the bar, I don't know what else they're going to do with it other than have to do something. Um, though, again, people rarely get disbarred, certainly not for something that she wouldn't even get removed from. Being disbarred is even bigger penalty. But Steve, I just think 
this has worked out as well for Donald Trump as if he had written him himself. Because if she had been removed, it's sort of to use the Jim Comey example. If DOJ had simply indicted Hillary Clinton, she then would have been able to fight back at that being, you know, them after her, she's the victim, etc. The worst case scenario for her was she had nothing to fight against. They didn't indict her. They just said she was reckless, etc., etc., and all these horrible things about her. Same thing for Fonnie Willis here. Uh, If she had been removed, it would have sort of made it more of this like, well, okay, Donald Trump, and now you're going to get prosecuted, and you know now they've got you dead to rights. Instead, he's got this limping prosecutor in a trial where even if he gets convicted, I just don't know that anyone's going to lead it a lot of credence because of who's prosecuting it. Yeah, I mean, it's a built-in argument for for Trump, right? I mean, he he can make that case regardless of what the outcome is here. And and look, I mean, we've talked about this before. He's just unbelievably lucky on this stuff, whether it's uh, you know, overreach by some of the prosecutors, whether it's misconduct or, you know, if it doesn't rise to the level of misconduct, um, bad conduct, improper conduct, conduct that's easily criticizable, however we want to describe it, like this gives him the argument that he wants. And look, w- whatever happened in the course of these these cases as they unfolded, we we could be certain of one thing, and that was that Donald Trump was going to attack the prosecutors. He was going to claim that this was all illegitimate, and he was going to sort of throw up his hands and fight back as hard as he possibly could. And if in that scenario, if you had the squeakiest clean district attorneys and prosecutors and and judges, Trump was going to cause some damage to sort of perceptions of the judiciary kind of regardless they have helped him do that they have helped him make his case i mean you know i i haven't i will full confession i have not paid attention to every single detail of what's happened in the the Fonnie willis case other than reading the collision which everybody of course should do um but i did watch some of that hearing live and it, it was you know you saw the divide um, come down basically to politics and wh- whose side you were on. And that is the opposite of what we should want. I mean, just from that point alone, that's the opposite of what you should want in a case of this potential import. And, you know, he was going to frame it as political regardless. And she sort of confirmed that framing by the way that she answered the question by performing for for the television cameras, uh, by making arguments that felt political. So continuing around the horn, you've also got the state criminal case in Manhattan, in New York. That was supposed to go to trial March 25th, but oops, it turns out there were tens of thousands of documents uh, that hadn't gotten to be reviewed by the defense. So even the prosecution has suggested they need at minimum a 30-day delay, the Trump team asking for a 90-day delay. Check. Uh, Then down in D.C., of course, the Supreme Court has that immunity argument that they'll be hearing about a month from today. Check. And down in Florida, what was really, in many ways, uh, what, what I've certainly always thought is the strongest legal case against Donald Trump, the classified documents case and the obstruction case, the judge down there issuing a bizarre order to the judges, uh, sorry, to the to the two legal teams on a sort of choose your own adventure jury instructions. I'll go into way more detail about why it's very strange uh, in advisory opinions, but she's behind in ruling on several motions in front of her. Then she's doing this weird order on jury instructions. All is not well in the state of Florida. There was then a news story that came out from David Latt over at Original Jurisdiction saying that multiple clerks have quit. So we're going to be finding out more about what's going on in Florida, but that doesn't look good either. I'm Jonah, I do start, I don't know, I do start wondering like believing in a different higher power than I think the one that humans have believed in all along. Like this does feel scripted. Yeah. I mean, maybe Baal is feeling his oats, right? (laughs) Um, He's been dormant for long enough and uh, he's, he's got a plan. Um, I will uh, 
make a strand. I don't know if we were planning on talking about it. It seems like it's a dead story now, but and, and rightfully so. But I kind of com- feel like, well, f- one way to think about it is like Trump is the millionth monkey who actually manages to bang out uh, Shakespeare on a typewriter, right? It, the law of large numbers says that that you know some someone throwing darts at at, at the stock pages can pick the three best stocks, right? Because someone's got to be able to. It, it, it just that's how it, it works. His entire life, he has done things that are ill advised, that presses luck, that people say you're not supposed to do, and he's been lucky with a lot of it. Not always as you know, not 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 lucky in the according to the narrative that he tells, but he's been in fact lucky as he's this outlier. And one of the reasons, one of the things that has aided him, particularly since he's got into politics is he does so many things that you're not supposed to do that it causes the system to screw up that he, that the system works to a certain degree on good faith. I mean, I, I know people like to make fun of me for talking about norms because you're not supposed to talk about norms. People talk about norms are just mad at Trump because he has mean tweets, right? And that kind of stuff. Um, but it's like no one in no one in Major League Baseball knows how they would resp- how they could deal with a baseball team owner who said, you know, the refs, the umpires, they rigged this. The scoreboard lied. We actually won that game, right? There's, no one has any kind of like muscle memory or understanding about how to deal with that kind of thing. And it's similar like that with politics. And so he forces errors on people all over the place. And what I was going to say earlier was compare it to this stupid bloodbath thing where I don't think anyone is shocked when I say Donald Trump says stupid and irresponsible stuff all the frigging time. But that doesn't mean that everything that can be interpreted as stupid and irresponsible um, or evil or inciting violence is inciting violence. It could just be a word that he used. And the media just jumped on the opportunity to say he's calling to foment violence where I just don't think a fair reading of the thing says that you know, people can disagree about it, but it's just not obvious that this was the hill to die on on this argument. Similarly, the Bragg case, you know, the Fannie Willis case, the 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 so many of these legal arguments and legal efforts, they are not the best arguments and the best efforts to go after Trump. But the system, his violence to the system, elicits people to overreact and overrespond, and screw things up in desperation. And I think that's what we're seeing on the in the justice system right now. Mike, uh, there was an interesting article today from a law professor that you and I might be writing about in the future about whether Donald Trump should and would declare bankruptcy based on these uh, civil rulings against him and what looks to be his inability to liquidate the funds fast enough. (laughs) Set aside all the legal reasons that it would be very good for him to declare bankruptcy. Lots of there's lots of sort of immediate things that come into effect to protect you when you're shielded uh, by the bankruptcy courts. By the way, this news article was kind of funny because it was also speculating at where Donald Trump would file. And it speculated that he might file in Houston because there's a judge, a bankruptcy judge in Houston whose daughter worked for Donald Trump. (laughs) Perfect. Perfect. Uh, There was like, the first comment was from a dispatch member that is like, are you kidding? Do you know who she is? (laughs) I don't think so. Um, so that it could be so much fun, though, Mike. I mean, if these are really good script writers, that's exactly what will happen. Would your dad have to recuse himself from the, that? Do you think? Is there a conflict there? I, I, I am not going to speculate on the <laughs> podcast as to what the legal requirements would be. Um, uh, there's obviously like actual financial interest and like real conflicts, but there is this sort of catch all on appearance of impropriety. I don't know what anyone thinks about what the appearance of impropriety would be. Obviously, some people think that I'm, quote, in Trump world, and other people think I'm never Trump. So maybe it's just the appearance of both sides. Well, I don't know. Uh, Of course, I'm his daughter. I'm not him when Supreme Court justices don't recuse just because their kids have opinions on things. 
So uh, there's all sorts of stuff. Again, like I, I have no idea what any ethics person would advise in that case. Uh, but Mike, I'm curious about the politics of this. Like, let's assume it's good for him financially and everything else to declare bankruptcy. He's declared bankruptcy before. And his voters, I would assume, would say something to the effect of, well, I mean, they went after him just to make him do this. So, you know, but those are his hardcore voters. A presidential candidate with four criminal indictments who just declared bankruptcy. I don't know. At some point, the pile gets high. Well, this has always been my theory about th- th- about the general, when I say the criminal cases, like the general idea of the criminal cases, that four indictments, that a tr- at least a trial going on, um, you add all of these, uh, all of these civil uh, findings uh, and, and, and penalties that he's has, that this, this is something speaking to the voters who aren't really paying that close attention when it gets close to the election, like we're going to be hearing a lot more about this for, for, for no other reason than there's going to be a lot of democratic money pay, paying for ads that could potentially bring all of this stuff up. Um, I certainly would go against Trump's own image as a sort of very successful businessman. If he's got to declare bankruptcy again, on the other hand, like you said, he's declared it before it's never stopped his image, you know, from him, from sort of creating this image of himself. Um, I don't know. I do think that this is, this is in um, our latest issue of the collision. Is there's a new poll from Ipsos um, that looks at kind of Americans' uh, viewpoints on all the criminal cases. And what I was struck by is Ipsos did this poll six months ago, and they they went back and asked again, essentially asking how much do people know about these cases? Each of the four, do they think he's guilty or not guilty, or they don't know? And across the board, first of all, um, it's about uh, 60% of people say they're familiar with the details. Um, I would really like to dig down on how familiar they actually are versus how familiar they say they are. Um, And uh, it's something like around half of the people say that they believe he's guilty uh, of each of the four in each of the four trials um, with a quarter mostly Republicans saying he's not guilty and the rest saying they don't know. Um, That has been consistent for the past six months. Um, I think things are, have the potential to change on that front as the general election really gears up. I know Biden himself doesn't want to get into this because it's his justice department that's prosecuting Trump in two of these trials. Uh, But I do think there will be a lot of democratic um, uh, pro democratic ads and groups that will be trying to target voters and remind them that like as as Nikki Haley liked to say in the last few weeks of her campaign this guy brings chaos you know this chaos follows him wherever he goes um you know we act as if that's a known thing about him but i i do think a lot of people uh need reminding voters need reminding of what they supposedly know i think that's true and um i'll be inter- interested to see how much Democrats uh, uh, really use this stuff. Steve, I have a real sense that most Americans, like more than most, a lot, a lot of Americans just are not tuning into this and going in both directions, meaning uh, some Americans have never tuned into it and they'll probably tune into it the closer we get. They'll start tuning in more. And some Americans were tuned in and have been so fed up with the whole thing that they've started to tune out. And we're certainly seeing that some of the media numbers. And I was wondering if you had thoughts on the sort of media consumption side of this campaign. Yeah, I mean, I I think you're right that most sort of normie Americans are not paying attention to every twist and turn of any of these things. I mean, I I would say, you know... It's March Madness. Go to 10... Yeah. Go to 10... Americans who who you could say pay careful attention to the news and ask them to give you a one sentence description of each of these cases. I would wager that one in 10 could maybe come close, honestly. Um, you know, I, I, I work at a news outlet. We publish, you know, your terrific newsletter that follows this stuff carefully. I try to keep up with the news. Uh, I pay attention to, to this to the extent that I can. And I'm not sure I would do that very well. 
honestly. So, uh, yeah, I, I think people aren't paying attention to every twist and turn of, of this stuff. And, you know, f- for, for many people, it, they just, you know, divide into their, their camps based on what they thought coming in. Do you think the justice system is going after Donald Trump, as he says at every turn, and as his, uh, his primary opponents uh, echoed in the campaign that they were waging against him or with him, I suppose? Um, or do you believe that he's guilty of these things and, and should be prosecuted for them? A lot of people, without respect to a careful look at the facts, have those answers. All right, let's do a little around the world. Chuck Schumer, obviously the highest ranking Jew in the history of the United States, gave his speech uh, criticizing Bibi Netanyahu, saying that he was one of the impediments to peace, not the only one. He also um, reiterated his strong support for Israel. But because Netanyahu was one of those impediments to peace, said that there should be calls for a new election and that he should be replaced in Israel. Jonah, this has been met with many reactions. Whether it's appropriate, setting aside the appropriateness, whether he's right, give me your reaction. So, uh, actually, I want to react first to the way you set it up. Uh, You're following in good fashion a great number of people, starting with Chuck Schumer himself, who often say Chuck Schumer is the highest, uh, highest ranking Jew in America. And I think it's a garbage term that he puts out there. Um, he's the one who tells people this all the time. He brags about it all the time. I don't know. I mean, like, we've had Jewish governors. Is it really true that a majority leader is who's not in the constitutional order, right? He's not the Senate pro tem, right? He's not in line to be president. Um, he's a high-ranking, politically high-ranking official in the Democratic Party in one branch of the legislature at one level of government in the United States. Um, and I say fe, which is a term of my people, um, uh, on this, this, this braggadocio from him that he has incepted into so much of the media. Um, that I think said, you're right, Jonah. Yeah. I'm fully I, convinced. Yeah. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a schmucky thing for him to constantly say that. And I will stand by that. Now, more broadly, I think, if we're going to talk about schmuckiness, uh, his speech was even worse. Um, it is wildly inappropriate for an American politician who claims to be a very close friend of Israel to, um, call for the change in government, uh, for the toppling, the deposition, whatever we're supposed to call it, of a prime minister of a democratic ally, particularly during a time of war. Imagine the blowback if Bibi Netanyahu said it is really time for Republican leadership in America today. The gnashing of teeth and rending of cloth um, would be biblical. New Testament or Old Testament? Old Testament. The uh, the 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 look out. The God of smiting and wrath. Um, not your lovey dovey <laughs> turn the other cheek Bible. Um, and. Uh, um, and so it's the punditry is not hard on this. He's running interference for Joe Biden. It's pretty obvious that he is doing that. Um, I think that the I sh- that on the merits, it's a really dumb argument because Bibi Netanyahu is not, in fact, calling the shots in Israel. He is part of a triumvirate of a unity government. The stuff that he is doing fighting in Gaza has to be approved by Benny Gantz and the other guy, which is. Uh, Kind of reminds me there was an old Saturday Night Live bit about how they um, changed Siskel and Ebert to the fat guy and the other one. Uh, regardless, the idea that like Bibi Netanyahu is responsible for all of the badness that is happening, however you define the badness, um, uh, is just scapegoating nonsense. And I'm not a fan of Bibi Netanyahu's, but I think that Schumer did not anticipate the blowback on this because a whole bunch of very moderate, pretty liberal Jewish organizations were like, whoa, 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 this is a bad move to start doing this, to start talking about how the United States officials are going to be calling for the calling for the, the the toppling of governments in Israel. And 
it also reinf- it's also a bad move because it reinforces this mythology that in fact Israel is a colony of the United States of America that it follows our orders and when the you know this this is the Elon Omar argument about Israel is that when the Jewish string pullers in America pull their strings the the Israeli marionette marionette the little satan does what we want and it's it's a grotesque effort that I think is going to politically backfire. In fact, I don't get it. Maybe you guys have an answer. Like Biden wants to still get all the credit for backing Israel while telegraphing to his base that he's not backing Israel. And I just don't know why anyone would sort of just, everyone would give him the credit that he wants for both positions rather than like be mad at him for taking the opposite position than the one that they support. I just, I don't understand the political, you know, uh, calculation. here. Hey, Steve, I don't want to, put you on the spot to solve the Middle East for us. But I guess I'm pretty confused on what anyone thinks the end game here is. They don't want Israel to, you know, have a military operation in Rafa. Um, They do seem to want them to wipe out Hamas. But even if they wipe out Hamas, they're saying that because of the way they do it, then there won't be a peaceful solution. Uh, I'm confused what any person of good faith thinks that the end game here can be at this point. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's pretty confused. If if you're Chuck Schumer, I think, the, the and you want to address this on substance, the question is, will what I say make it harder or easier for Israel to wipe out Hamas, which Chuck Schumer, Joe Biden, and other Democrats say that they favor? There's no way you answer that question in the affirmative and then go ahead and say what say what he said. I mean, you, it, it obviously makes things harder. And I think the 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 problem with this, the the difficulty I have with this, is that it's hard to come up with any other explanation other than politics, right? I mean, I think Jonah's right about that. This, that's what this that's what this is. Um, Joe Biden has done everything he can to um, bring back the progressive left, not just the sort of, um, you know, Rashida Tlaib contingent, but others on the progressive left who have adopted this cause as their own. Um, And whether it's in his public statements, whether it's in things that he has said and done that I think really approach moral equivalence, equivalency, um, or whether it's the steady stream of leaks out of the White House about how tough he's being with, with uh, Bibi Netanyahu. They're trying to, to recover at a point where he's at 38% approval, and part of the reason he's at 38% approval is he's lost some people on the progressive left. They're trying to get that back. Like This isn't that complicated. I, I would say, on, on Chuck Schumer specifically, has Chuck Schumer ever called for regime change in Iran? I mean, is it the case that Chuck Schumer is calling for regime change in Israel before he's calling for regime change in Iran? And I'd say that like half facetiously, but there's a point there. I mean, it's pretty obnoxious, I think, to, to do that and to to take on whatever you think of Bibi Netanyahu to, to, to challenge an ally in the middle of a war and a war that, you know, not only the Israelis, but I think a lot of us believe it is potentially an existential war. Um, I just think it's really bad form. Mike. Yes. The world. Well, can I say something quickly about this Chuck Schumer thing? I, I, I think it's a great example of how Chuck Schumer is extremely clumsy when it comes to these kind of political efforts. It's, it's almost as if he thought that only the progressive left would hear this speech that he was giving on on the floor of the Senate as the Senate Majority Leader and highest, well, okay, I won't say highest ranking Jew in in America. Um, like it, I, I, it seems, it seems that this is kind of a like this is not the first time that Chuck Schumer has done something, uh, has attempted to sort of thread some kind of political needle and done it in a clumsy manner. And at the end of the day, I don't understand why the Biden White House, why Chuck Schumer and, 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 and the rest of the sort of the Democratic leadership 
feel that they have to do this. I get that they're hearing a lot. They're getting a lot of guff from the progressive left on this issue. Um, I think a more confident Biden would recognize that these are voters. These are constituencies that don't have anywhere else to go. Um, uh, you don't have to put a thumb in their eye uh, on on things, but you you don't have to coddle them either. If you're concerned about them not coming home in, in November, I, I just think that that's a concern that is going to be out of your hands. And you you if if you're looking at this from a gross, just kind of pure political standpoint, you 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 get gain a lot more by tacking to the center on this issue than you do by trying to play. Uh, this this weird political game. All right. We're moving on to not worth your time. And I want to talk about Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln, of course, is always worth our time. We could have a whole podcast just on Abraham Lincoln. I'm curious if any of you have watched the new Apple series Manhunt about the hunt for John Wilkes Booth after Lincoln's assassination. No. I have not. I have not, but I'm intrigued by the the teasers. Have you? So first of all, Manhunt, the book by James Swanson, for a long time has been my favorite book. It's, you know, I, what during the pandemic, I published my like top 10 or so, I think, favorite books for Dispatch listeners. And that was definitely on the list. High, high praise. It's a real thriller page turner. So this is a series loosely based off the book. Of course, they're going to take some liberties to make it even more thrillery and fun. Thrillery? I like that. I yes, like it. Jonah. I like it. Some would say thrilling, but Sarah says thrillery, <laughs> and I like that. Uh -huh. <laughs> but one of the things that I love most about it is that, in my opinion, they have tried to do Lincoln correctly, meaning he's kind of awkward. He has a high-pitched voice. It's like a little bit um, jarring. It doesn't sound very presidential, quote-unquote. He's sort of gangly. And I think it's really great. And they're also doing a series about Ben Franklin with Michael Douglas uh, as he tries to win France over to the American cause after the Declaration of Independence. And it just feels like the musical Hamilton has opened up this whole world where people are interested in revisiting what we think about our own history. And Obviously, the fight over the 1619 Project and just school curriculum in general and our pop culture. Um, I wonder whether we will look back at this era as being pretty miserable in sort of a 1968 way, but that what comes out of it is something good, which is it's actually not a bad thing for us to take a renewed interest and really fight over what our history is, what our narrative is, what we're going to tell ourselves is like what we stand for as a country because every other country doesn't really even have to ask that question because they weren't founded on an idea. Um, we did start to run an experiment of self-government and I'm curious, starting with you, Steve, if you think the conversation is going well. Yeah, in a word, no. <laughs> um <laughs> In, in part because of things like the 1619 Project. You know, I would say even if you believe, but really probably, especially if you believe in teaching a 360 degree sort of picture of, of U.S. history, um, the good, the bad, the ugly, the complicated, the awkward, the difficult, all of it, um, you, you don't want it to be sort of the, the ax grinding of uh, ideological interests in the present day. And, you know, we've seen, we've certainly seen a lot of reporting about the um, excesses of the kind of revisionism that asks us to um, sort of ignore context in history, you know, asks us not to honor people who are complicated but deserve to be honored anyway, right? I mean, we all, the extremes of, of this are the, you know, People who want to remove George Washington from all public appearances and people who are taking names off of buildings of, of founders who've done great things, but were slaveholders. Our ability, it seems to me, is just in terms of a, a national dialogue to address complicated issues in nuanced and meaningful ways 
we're not doing very well on that right now. Do you disagree with that, Sarah? I think I might, because in order to have any conversation, you're going to have to have people on the extremes or else it's not really a conversation. Meaning, uh, you know, I, I see this in the, the media setting all the time. You sort of have this thing that we all then talk about. But if there's nothing that we're even talking about, then the conversation itself never happens. So you needed the 1619 Project to start the conversation to begin with. But I think by and large, it's being rejected. Um, and if it weren't controversial, it's not though. It's not. I know it's though. not. By I don't everyone. think it is. I think it's being rejected. It's it's being rejected in in our circles, and we've run pieces about it at the Dispatch. And I think people who have taken a, a serious look at the project have pointed out its flaws in great detail. Yes, most history professors. Yeah, most history professors have weighed in and said it's it's bogus. That doesn't mean it's not being taught in schools. It is being taught in schools. Right. I mean, this there's a whole campaign. There's an entire effort to have the 1619 project taught in schools. School administrators that resist are bullied. Um, you know, the, the, the implication is that and sometimes it's not just an implication is that they're racist for not wanting to teach 1619. The New York Times were stood by um, the the project, even after all of the, the flaws were pointed out. I, I, I'm not sure if, if you believe that it's sort of bogus history. Um, we're, they're, they're, they're succeeding in just sort of bowling over critics and teaching it the way that they want to teach it anyway. I don't think they will in the end. I agree. It, but again, I don't think we'd even be getting to have the conversation if it didn't gain some traction. And so in that sense, I'm almost grateful that they put that out there so that it could be this uh, thing to reject in a sense. And at the same time, you have Hamilton as the most popular musical of all time. But the tenth graders who are getting it aren't rejecting it. Oh yeah, right? no, I'm I'm already acknowledging that this generation we've just we've we've screwed them over in any variety of ways. That's like maybe the least of it. But yes, that sucks for them. But Hamilton is the most popular musical. We've now got shows about Lincoln and Ben Franklin just on like Apple TV for pop consumption. I don't know. I think I think. That that exhausted majority, silent majority, whatever we're calling them these days, might be more into America than Twitter would have you think, Jonah? Yeah, I'm more sympathetic to your point than Steve is. I also think... What else is new? A la, a la Adam Smith, there's a lot of ruin in a nation. And um, the 1619 Project really is garbage and has done a lot of go- damage and harm. Um, and... There is an effort to teach it in schools, which I think is absolutely terrible. Fortunately, I was just looking at, you know, some of the the reading proficiency uh, results for Newark for some reason. And like the best district in Newark was only getting um 9% of the students hitting proficient reading at a third grade level. So they're not reading the 1619 project either. Um, but, um, um, hey, I'm looking at the upside of, of educational dysfunction. No, but, um, but I do think you're right. And, uh, that, that you need, um, a reacting agent to get people to run to the defense of some things. And, you know, let us not forget that, you know, Charles Beard a hundred years ago, uh, you know, he wrote the economic interpretation of the constitution, which was this sort of soft Marxist thing that the founding fathers were um, solely interested in their own economic self-interest. And it elicited a massive intellectual project to debunk Charles Beard and that whole analysis. And I think we're going to see a generation of, of similar efforts about the 1619 project. I will say that when you brought up Lincoln um, at the beginning of this, I just assumed that you were joining the remarkable chorus of people who say that my conversation with Alan Gelzo, uh, who has a new book, Our Ancient Faith, about Abraham Lincoln, um, is probably the dean of Lincoln scholars, uh, Lincoln historians, that you were just trying to plug what a wonderful conversation that was because a lot of people, people are saying it was maybe the best remnant ever. And it's not say this is so Trumpy. And it's not my, well, that was the joke. And Abraham Lincoln is getting recognized more and more these days, I think. Uh, in part <laughs> because I also, of your podcast. <laughs> also, when you were talking about Abraham Lincoln and the, they were doing the Abraham, the real Abraham Lincoln, right. I was reminded of the week, the old Weekly Standard cover about whether Lincoln was gay, and then you called the show Manhunt, and I was like, oh my God, Sarah is going there. <laughs> but uh, that's a different conversation. Uh, have, have I ever told you all my Lincoln bedroom story? 
Is it appropriate for this no. podcast? I don't know. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> Not safe for pods. I'll I'll skip over some of the details, <laughs> but the Whoa. West Wing. Wow. Wow. Was, this is gonna get. This is gonna get a rating. <laughs> the West Wing uh, HVAC system needed renovation, and so all meetings with the president were being done in the residence. And so I was in a meeting with President Trump and uh, the Attorney General, the FBI Director, the Chief of Staff, and the National Security Advisor. I was the only woman in the room, and as the meeting wrapped up, uh, the president looked at me and said. Do you want to go see the Lincoln bedroom? Yeah, I, was, I do. I will tell you in the back <laughs> of my head, I thought, yeah, there's no downside to this. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, of course, Mr. President, and you've never seen old men jump up faster <laughs> in that room <laughs> to also go on this tour of the Lincoln bedroom. <laughs> um and it was actually really cool. And I got to to see the mirror and the desk and like all the the things. Um, it was a weird day. It was a weird one. But um, yeah, I am very into Lincoln. I think there's a real debate to be had over who the most important leader of the United States has ever been between Washington and Lincoln. I think Washington setting the norms, Jonah, and in particular, of course, stepping aside. You just can't really beat that because without that, that, you know, the country's first transition for the history of any country in the world is always so significant and really lives or dies by that first transition. But even so, Lincoln, man, Lincoln, that second inaugural gets me every time. And for listeners, if you have not visited the Lincoln Memorial at night, just to read that second inaugural with sort of those like, I don't know, the misty lights and everything and dark and to see the other Americans who brought their children who could go to Disney World or Mall of America or some other concrete palace and instead they've taken them to learn about their country's history. I don't know, Steve. I'm feeling pretty optimistic. But Mike, last word to you as a father of boys and who loves America. How much do you love America today, right? Yeah. Defend the 1619 project, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm being set up in so many different ways. No, well, I'm actually going to uh, ignore whatever quasi question you just asked me and 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 take issue with the premise of your initial question, which is that only now pop culture is sort of interested in history. I mean, literally 12 years ago, there was a movie called Lincoln in which in which one of the one of our greatest living actors, Daniel Day Lewis portrayed Lincoln in, 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 in a portrayal that was deemed very much, much more accurate than past cinematic portrayals. He had a thin, reedy voice, um, you know, talking about the passage of, uh, of the 14th amendment. So, so, so that happened. He won award, you know, Academy award for that. A few years before that, there was the John Adams miniseries on HBO. So I, I do, there's also, I can't believe no one's mentioning Abraham Lincoln, vampire hunter. Which was awesome. Did it, did it really ne- even need to be mentioned? I mean, I think we're all thinking right. it. Uh, Joe. <laughs> By the way, I'm pretty sure the movie Lincoln was about the oh, 13th, 13th Amendment. Amendment. I'm sorry. The 14th I'm sorry. Amendment, which is a little bit relevant to my overall point, because another way to read that was that that movie was about the f- passage of the 13th Amendment ending involuntary servitude and slavery, maybe less about Lincoln, right? Okay, but your point, my, my point is that it's about history and and i do think like americans are and kind of have always been very much interested in um in our our myths and i mean i do have the entire ken burns civil war documentary memorized from the number of times that i listened to it in my father's car and at our house and that would have been in the what that was in the 90s 90s yeah yeah a shokin farewell was the name of the uh the the song i can play it on the viola it was my audition i can play it on several instruments it's a great uh it's a (laughs) Name them. Name uh, the trumpet and the piano. Okay, two instruments. Uh, <laughs> but uh, look, so so I think I think I think everything is fine. I I'm not a doomsayer on this stuff because um, lest us lest we not forget, there was an effort to rename the schools that, uh, in San Francisco uh, that were named after Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln, and George Washington a couple of years ago. Uh, those failed. The people on the school board who were trying to get them to change those names. Uh, 
were were uh, uh, turned off of the you know were elected out of uh, you know their positions there. So I think it's all fine. It's all a big mess. Um, you just gotta you gotta teach your kids, you know, teach the children well, as Crosby, Stills, and Nash said, and um, and that's all we can hope for. That's my that's that's my position on on this strange topic. And with that, listeners, we'll look forward to hearing all the instruments that you can play Ashkan Farewell on in the comments section of this podcast. That's the only thing we want to hear about from this podcast. Uh, someone who can play it on more instruments than Mike and more obscure ones than the viola, like me. Although my viola is downstairs right now, out of its case. Like, it's ready to go, Mike. So we can, like, let's see if you can still play it on trumpet. Because I think you might be talking a big 1996 game here, but not <laughs> not much of all. Steve, what are you showing me right now? That's, that's a, a violin. That's a fiddle right there. You should oh, know the- what that is if if you've seen if you've played the viola. Is that a sleeping bag on the floor? I didn't know if that was like a what what's on the floor there that you were showing me. No, that's my jacket. But up there is. <laughs> oh, <me. laughs> that's what I thought you were. This showing is great me. content. This is a violin. Steve, do you play the violin? Um, um, you know, I know he doesn't I, play the violin. It's because there's the a violin. violin by itself on a shelf without being in a case and on its side. Um, that is not great for violins. This violin is pretty well trashed. It was my high school rental violin. Um, I did not. It, I, I I rode my 10 speed to school with it every day. And so it got pretty well banged up. Wait, if it's a rental, why didn't you have to return it? Um, we bought it at the end. We had paid so much in rent that we sort of it was like rent to own option. Oh. So we bought it at the end because we were optimistic about my ability to 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 continue to play. I loved playing the violin. I wasn't great. I didn't practice much. I can't play your shoken choking whatever. A shoken farewell. But I can play widespread panic. I've played some <laughs> widespread panic. Um they have a great song with a, a violin solo. Um I taught myself that. Uh but I don't play very much anymore. Jonah, what can you play? I play no instruments whatsoever. None. This is the one thing in which you have failed to be this Renaissance man that I think of you. Oh, as. I've failed in many other. Ways. <laughs> uh, but no, I. I <laughs> what languages do you speak, Jonah? I, I, I speak no languages fluently, <laughs> except English, <laughs> and even that's questionable. I'm the one who said, "What was the word? Thrillery." <laughs> <laughs> I was, you know, I, I, I'm trying ever since the state versus government thing, and then the thing with the highest ranking Jew. I'm trying not to like do my picky yoon nitpicky stuff but like i was uh-huh. going to pick a fight with steve for using the phrase regime change but i decided to just let it go it's because uh, in part it's big of it, you. well no it's caught on it's caught on now to mean something that it doesn't mean but like regime is supposed to actually mean the system of government and not just like one administration or another and it has been so used and abused now that people just think that like every four years america has regime change um <laughs> you know when an election <laughs> And it just doesn't. Do but. you know what you're doing right now, Jonah? Mm-hmm. That is a paralypsis. It's a paralypsis. You said, I'm not going, I was going to do this. I'm and not then he going proceeded to do it. We're not, rec- well, this is, we're, and this, then you is, did it. But this isn't going to be in the show, it. is it? I thought that we were oh, for sure it's going to be in the, be in the, the, in the show. show. I thought we were yeah, done. 100%. That was, the, that was the most interesting thing you said over the last hour. I thought we were done. Well, then, all right, let's, let's have the argument. No, this was a, this was a test show. Now let's actually do the real show. <laughs> <laughs> and with that we'll see you next week yeah. and thank you for all your birthday wishes everybody <laughs> really it was touching <laughs> i knew it was good so i knew it was when you the said podcast that. is it was. it's going out tomorrow <laughs> it would be it would be dishonest to say happy birthday today uh, yeah. Yeah. for a podcast all he's <laughs> doing is trying to elicit more birthday wishes that or, was or, the play or any like he, we there said weren't happy enough. birthday in Slack. Someone else said happy birthday in Slack, and I added. So did an emoji. I. I clicked the cake emoji. <laughs> what more do you want? I clicked an emoji too. <laughs> Which one did you pick, Mike? I clicked the parrot. With I clicked. The head I clicked the going cake. Round. That's just oh, that's okay. just how so I was we feeling. Pick different yeah. emojis, uh, Jonah. I appreciate it. Thank God, you. It's, it's touching. We were so thoughtful. It's so touching. Yeah, I'm now as old we'll as David French. We'll play farewell for you. Yeah, you're you're two years older than I am now. I know it's freaking ridiculous. As of today, that's yeah. not how that works. That's not how math or what? the Earth going around the sun. None of it. None of it works. What? Okay, we're really done now. What? Bye. All right. Goodbye. <laughs> Asshole. <laughs>